In the last video, I showed some basic techniques for managing state in your game. Today, I'm going to show you some techniques you can use when you need something more complex than just a simple state machine. But be warned, there are a lot of ways to make a state machine, and this video is by no means an attempt to be anything close to an exhaustive look at the subject, but rather address a few common pain points and show some techniques for dealing with them by upgrading the state machine I introduced previously. So to kick things off, let's first discuss a few concepts that can be used to solve a variety of problems with a growing state machine, the first of which is dependency injection. Dependency injection is about supplying dependencies at runtime rather than hard coding them, and is actually something that already exists in the starter state machine. Recall that the states declare a parent variable to hold a reference to the player, but that the variable doesn't actually get set until the player sets it in its ready function. That's dependency injection. The states declare they depend on having a reference to a player, but not any specific instances of a player. Compare that to if each state did have a hard-coded path to a specific instance, which is not very flexible as our code is looking for a singular node to control and is also requiring our game tree to follow a specific structure. Dependency injection frees our code from the details of how we get a reference to an object. With this concept in mind, one technique for making state machines flexible is to design them so that they can use different instances of the same type. If all of your game objects use the same physics implementation, such as Godot's character body classes, you can design your states around this class for handling movement and other physics logic, declare that's the type of object they'll control, and share that same physics code across your game. The current state code relies on a player instance, which is better than nothing in case we want to have different player-controlled characters, but it could easily be made more generic by letting it control any similar character body 2D node, which is the type of physics body the player is. Updating my previous state machine code, I just changed the declaration of the parent from player to character body 2D in the code for both the individual state declaration and the state machine. As the player class already inherits from character body 2D, its script doesn't require any changes. And now our state machine can move any similar physics body, but there's still more we can abstract out. Let's also update the reference to our animations, which are currently referenced as a child of the parent node. Rather than always assuming there's an animations property on our parent, we can create another dependency in our state class for the animated sprite 2D class, which should be sufficient for a variety of animated entities, including the player. As this is a new dependency and not just replacing an existing one, we'll need to update the entire chain of initialization this time, from the player to the state machine to the state. And with that, we've already made our states more flexible as we can support different physics-based objects and we no longer make any assumptions about the structure of the parent object. But there's still more to do before we can really make use of our state machine on other objects. For example, our original movement code has several lines that reference user inputs, which is problematic if we want to use this code on any non-player characters. Ideally, we also don't want to have to write new movement code for every different type of movement input. One option here is to abstract away the specifics of how movement is decided as our state machine really just needs to move how we tell it to. How that decision is made is beyond what the input related code cares about. So let's establish a contract of sorts defining how the state machine can query some other object, the specifics of which we'll come back to in a moment, for information about how to move and update our state machine to use this new object accordingly. Really, this contract is just an interface, but since Godot does not have support for interfaces as of version 4.1, we'll have to get a little bit creative with the implementation. One option is to declare a class with some basic no-op functions in it that your components can inherit and override, much like what our base state class is already doing. Another option is to use Godot's support for duct typing and just use consistent function names on everything without worrying about declaring specific types. In my own projects, I typically prefer the class-based approach just because I like to have the benefits of type hints, auto-completion, and so on. But to help cut down on the boilerplate code today, let's just go with the duct-typed approach and decide on a few common function names we'll implement. Get movement direction will return the desired direction of movement for the character. As the sample project is a platformer, we only care about the movement vector along the x-axis. But if you want to expand this to support two-dimensional movement, you can, of course, just change the return type to a vector2 and update your code appropriately. Once jump returns a boolean indicating if the character wants to jump right now. I use the term wants as this function only tells us if the jump input has been triggered, not whether or not the character can jump at this specific point in time, as that is something the state machine should get the final say over. And in case you're wondering, you could condense these two functions down into a single function, returning a vector2 where the y value represents whether or not jump is pressed, but for demonstration purposes, I'm going to keep things just a little bit more readable and keep them separated. With our functions defined, the question then becomes where do we implement these functions? 
We could implement them on the parent object directly, but that would hurt code reuse since we'd have to add the code to every entity in our game. To get around this, we could do an inheritance-based approach and let our parent objects inherit from some top-level class that implements the functions, but if we need to implement multiple interfaces that vary between objects, or just have multiple implementations of different interfaces, that can also become problematic as our inheritance tree has to grow to support different feature sets. Instead, we can go with a component-based approach, where we simply add a node to our character object that has a script implementing our desired functions on it, and pass this node to our state machine. The benefits of this approach is that reusing code is as simple as adding a node to our scene with the desired script on it, but it's also easy to change behavior on a per-entity basis without having to make any modifications to the parent object. Just replace the script on this node and you're done. So with our plan decided on, let's now create two components implementing this interface. One for the user-controlled player, and one for a very simple AI-controlled character. First up, let's look at the player component, which really just wraps basic input functions behind our interface. We can then make a child node on the player, attach this script to it, and, as we'll need this in pretty much every state, we can pass this into our state initialization code alongside the references to the parent and animation nodes. Now we can access move component wherever we need to. If we want to update our move state for instance, we could swap out the old input code with our new function. All that's different is we now ask the move component about how to move rather than pulling the input class directly. Hopefully you can already see the benefits this technique offers. We can now swap out move component for anything that returns a boolean for jumping and a float for horizontal movement and have our state just work. To demonstrate this, let's make a very old school AI controller that's just about as simple as you can get. This component keeps a reference to the parent character body 2D to implement a simple controller where the character moves in one direction until it hits a wall, then starts moving in the opposite direction. Once jump is still implemented, since that is a requirement of our interface, but since this character isn't allowed to jump, we just always return false. Put this on a new character to see it in action, or even just replace the component on the player, and watch it now automatically move around. That's the power of abstracting state functionality into components. One codebase can now support any movement controller as long as it implements our interface. The last concept I want to introduce is that of hierarchical state machines, which involves using inheritance to make your state logic reusable across multiple states, something that, again, we're actually already doing in my starter state machine code. Recall that the code for the base state implementation has an enter function that automatically plays an animation when the state is entered. Since our other states inherit from this class, we only have to write this code once and then can reuse it across every state. Some states define a custom enter function that extends this functionality, but others don't. That's the idea of a hierarchical state machine. Functionality defined in the superclass that you can fall back on, extend, or override as appropriate. For instance, you could throw the code that reads from our movement component into a separate function to make it easier to modify or override in a subclass. To demonstrate this, let's implement a dash state, which will work just like the movement state, except the player is locked into this state for a fixed amount of time and cannot jump to exit this state early. To start, let's add two new functions in the state class for reading inputs from our movement component so that we can override them later on. Our move state and any other state can then use these functions similar to when they use the movement component directly. If we want to make a dash state in a hierarchical fashion, we could subclass the move script, override get movement input to return a constant value when we should be dashing, override get jump to always return false so that we can't jump out of the dash state, track our time in this new state so we can automatically exit when the dash duration has elapsed, and then let the parent move state take care of the actual movement logic. With that state defined, we just need to add it to another state node and update the states we want to be able to enter the dash state from, in this case probably the idle and move states. And that's an example of using hierarchical states to override and modify behavior from a state. While the dash state does still have a fair bit going on, we do at least avoid having to re-implement the basic movement code for this one. Now I'd like to shift gears a bit and talk about some common pain points you may find yourself in with state machines and some potential solutions for them. Again, this won't be exhaustive by any means, just an attempt to share a bit more based off of questions I've gotten over time. If you've got any techniques or design patterns you like to use for solving state-related issues, do feel free to share in the comments. One of the most common issues you may run into is how to do two separate things at once, such as attacking while moving in a running gun situation. As state machines are exclusive entities, one machine handling two different states doesn't really make sense, but you also don't want to have to duplicate every movement related state for every attacking related state so that you can have every possible permutation handled by one state machine alongside managing whatever data or animations go along with all of that. 
The solution sometimes is to just make a second state machine so that you can have one set of states for movement and another for attacking, though note that you will want your animations for the two states to be separate as well, if applicable. This configuration is known as a concurrent state machine and is a solid choice when you have multiple states to manage that are largely or wholly independent from one another. To create one, you just make a second state machine using your implementation of choice and pipe each event from the parent to both state machines. If we were to extend the original starter state machine to have a concurrent state machine, the scene would look like this and our player code would now pipe events to both state machines. The rest would be as before, with each state machine managing the states that they're responsible for. But what about if one state machine needs to know what the other is up to? Maybe you can only do a big attack when you're not in a jump state, for instance, but otherwise can do attacks as you please. Likewise, maybe you shouldn't be able to start jumping when a big attack is in progress. In cases like these, it may be enough to just give each state machine a reference to the other so that state checks can be ran where appropriate. But as much as we'd like to keep our states and potential concurrent state machines completely independent of each other, there are times where data needs to be shared between them beyond what a quick and dirty bit of code can solve. Maybe the run state should drain stamina, impacting how long future run states can be maintained. Maybe using any ability should prevent you from using another for some time. Or maybe you just need to remember the last time an event happened in some other state. Regardless of the specifics, it all comes down to the question of how to share data between states. And there are two approaches I tend to lean towards. The first is to lift data up the hierarchy. I mention this because it's important to remember that state machines are for state-independent logic, and shouldn't necessarily maintain every bit of data your character may have. Some items, such as character stamina or other stats, probably belong higher up the chain and should maybe be in their own components so that you can easily manage related features, such as adding status effects, displaying stats in the UI, and so on. You will have to do a bit of wiring to get the data available in the states where it's needed, but that's just how it is sometimes. Other times, having a data store that can be used by the states to read, write, and share data between can be an option. This could be something as simple as a dictionary on the managing state machine which the states can have a reference to, or even a separate component that can run any amount of custom logic, emit signals, and whatever else you need. Alternatively, if you don't want to have a shared data store, you can always modify your states and state machines to return and pass data around directly. A simple setup might involve returning an object when transitioning states that holds both the new state to transition to and any relevant data it may need to be aware of. As you can probably tell, you've got options depending on what you need and what appeals to you. It's all just tools in the toolbox, and what you'll need will vary based on your situation. And that's all I have to say about state machines for now. As a reminder, this is just a few techniques I think are useful to know and to get you thinking about how different problems can be solved. But there's plenty more that I've excluded for one reason or another. If you want more reading on state machines specifically for games, maybe check out Game Programming Patterns or Programming Game AI by example.